who was a trained military engineer, methodical, pra practical, but he also had a vision for British expansion in the region. In fact, he had long wanted the British to expand from Malacca out into the Malay Peninsula, but um, the company didn't want that at all. Now, Farker had been commandant and resident of Malacca from 1803 until 1818, when Britain was occupying it during the Napoleonic Wars. And Farker's early actions paved the way for Raffles Treaty. In 1816, it was Farker who urged the formation of a new British base south of Malacca, as he knew the Dutch would be returning to Malacca after peace was declared and his first suggestion was the island of Rio. Then in 1818, he signed a commercial treaty with Sultan Abdul Rahman of Johor. And this treaty allowed Britain most favored trading nation status. Mm. Yep. But Farquhar knew that something more concrete was needed. And he negotiated with the Raja Muda who was the effective ruler of the Johor Empire, to allow a British post on the Karaman Islands. However, his superior, Colonel Bannerman in Penang, opposed this idea, although he did forward it to Lord Hastings, the Governor General in, Malacca, in Calcutta. Now, Hastings and Bannerman were being lobbied by British merchants who were worried about the negative impacts on their trade once the Dutch had returned to Malacca and Batavia. Raffles, who was visiting Calcutta, also advocated a base at Rio. Hastings agreed, as he wanted to build on the foothold established by Farker's commercial treaty. And this is Lord Hastings. Hastings sent Raffles on a twofold mission. First, he was to solve a dynastic dispute in Aceh. And secondly, he was to find a spot for a new base without upsetting the Dutch. Hastings appointed Farker as resident and commandant of any new settlement that Raffles might establish because of Farker's long experience and expertise. Farker met up with Raffles in Penang in December 1818, and they discussed potential sites. On the 19th of January, Farker sailed from Penang. Then Raffles disobeyed the sequence of Hastings' orders and set off with his fleet to catch up with Farker and take over control of the expedition. They stopped at the Karaman Islands, but found them unsuitable. Raffles then called a meeting of the ship's commanders to consider their next move. And Farker suggested that the fleet stopped at Singapore. Raffles agreed, because by now, Singapore was on his mind as a viable option. Once the men landed in, at Singapore on the 28th of January, Raffles realized it was the ideal place. But, and history's full of buts, there was one big problem. Singapore was part of the Johor Empire, which was under resurrected Dutch control. And then Raffles came up with a clever, but very deceitful plan. The Temengong, who governed Singapore, and Farker had told him of the disputed succession to the Johor Sultanate. The designated heir, Tonku Long, was living in exile, and his brother, Abdul Rahman, had been placed on the throne. But he had been accepted as the de facto Sultan, even by Raffles. So, Raffles offered to make Tongku Long the Sultan of Johor in return for the lease of a small piece of land 
for a trading post. And when you think of it, it's quite inconceivable that a jumped up London clerk could offer to make someone the Sultan of the Johor Empire, but no one seemed to query it. And on the 6th of February, a treaty detailing this was signed by the new and illegal Sultan, the Temengong, and Raffles. Farka did play a background role in all of this. He knew and sympathised with Tunku Long, and he colluded with Raffles to have Tunku Long brought over to Singapore, and later to protect Raffles and himself was not totally honest when Lord Hastings later queried the circumstances of Tunkulong's arrival. Farker had also helped Raffles with the negotiations leading to the treaty, and the Dutch officials saw Farker as exerting influence in the background. So, on Feb 7th of February, Raffles sailed for Arche. Farker was left in Singapore with only about 200 soldiers, very little food, little money, and few provisions. And troubles soon arose. Nine days later, the new Sultan and the Temengong wrote secretly to the Dutch, the real Sultan, and the Rajamuda, begging forgiveness for having signed the treaty with Raffles. They explained that while Farka was at Rio, Raffles had forced the, forced the throne and subsequent treaty upon Sultan Hussein. Uh, that was the name Raffles gave to Tungulong. And it was Farka who persuaded the nobles to retract those statements. They then composed new letters stating that the English had established the settlement with, quote, their free will and consent. Now Bannerman remained how suspicious of how genuine, how genuine the recantation was. He believed it was written under the control of Farka. And moreover, the words will and consent were later added into the English draft, but they became embedded into future copies of the letter. Well, no sooner was that matter settled, than another problem flared up. The Dutch were furious at Raffles' actions, and they insisted that Sultan Hussein was a usurper who had no right to permit a British post on Singapore, which fell under their influence. In March, reliable reports were received that they were going to retake the, force by po the, the post by force. Parker asked Bannerman for military backup. He refused and instead offered to send down a vessel to evacuate Farker's party along with those who feared Dutch revenge. Bannerman desperately tried to persuade Farker that neither his honour as a soldier nor the honour of the British government justified shedding blood to retain this post. But he left the decision to Farka. And despite his small number of men and limited munitions, Farka refused to withdraw. He knew it was the East India Company's last opportunity to establish a strategic foothold in the Eastern Archipelago. And all Bannerman could do was advise as Farker was answerable to Raffles, who was by then in Arche. Thus, Britain's hold on the tiny outpost during those first six weeks was fragile. It stayed in British hands solely because of Farker. The danger of the Dutch invasion passed after Hastings and Baron van der Capellen the Dutch Governor General of Batavia, right, decided to leave the question of Singapore's status to the diplomats in Europe. So Raffles did not purchase the island of Singapore, nor did he acquire it. Even holding on to the rented 
and temporary trading post was most uncertain. And the acquisition of Singapore was beyond Raffles' hands. Now, while the diplomats argued, Farker got to work, and with the full confidence of Raffles, the settlement grew rapidly. Jungle was felled, land leveled, and the mangrove swamps were cleared and drained. Farker organized the constructions of warehouses, a reservoir and aqueduct, bridges, roads, wells, and public buildings. Most of the buildings were wooden, but Farker provided Indian settler Kamache Pillay with money and land to construct brick-making kilns so that more substantial buildings could be erected. Raffles had ordered Farker to build complex defences, but lacking the money and material to fully comply, Farker constructed what he considered to be the most necessary. Thus he, con he constructed a 600-foot battery, which housed 28 guns, and repaired nearly two kilometres of the old Singapore lines to link up with the battery. Now we must remember that Singapore was basically a military post, thus most early construction was for the troops, as well as the cantonment. These included three small hospitals, a powder magazine, barracks, guard rooms, and officers' quarters. Parker also had constructed a large residency which housed his family and among other uses served as a treasury, public office, courthouse and chapel. He was a very religious man and he paid for this out of his own pocket. When Raffles returned to Singapore at the end of May 1819, he praised Farker's tireless exertions, noting that, quote, the country has assumed a new appearance, the harbour is filled with shipping, and our defences are already very respectable. He boasted to Colonel Adam Brooke that everyone is comfortably housed, provisions are in abundance, the troops are healthy, and everything here bears the appearance of Content. Now, of course, Farker, uh, Raffles took full credit for this progress, albeit exaggerating, and writing the words which are probably familiar to you. Singapore is a child of my own, and I have made it what it is. Less well known is the following sentence. You may easily conceive with what zeal I apply myself to the clearing of forests, cutting of roads, building of towns, framing of laws, etc., etc. But of course, Raffles wasn't even in Singapore. It was Farker who had supervised all that work. Raffles did acknowledge it officially, praising Farker for his zealous cooperation and essential assistance and declaring that the settlement's interests could not have been entrusted to abler or better hands. Excuse me. Raffles compiled another set of instructions for Farker and drew up revised arrangements in June 1819. And these were co-signed by Farker, the Sultan, and the Temengong. After remaining in Singapore for only four weeks, Raffles departed for Ben Coolin, and he did not return for the next three and a half years. Singapore's trade and population continued to escalate, much to the surprise of everyone. And although Raffles periodically claimed all the credit for that progress, it was a reflection of Farker's competence and his good reputation. By late 1821, 
Singapore was a successful commercial settlement with a population of 5,000, not 10,000 as Raffles claimed. There was a well-built town developing on the north bank of the river, a large Chinese kampong on the south bank, and a large boogies compound along the Rosha River, while the plain at Kampong Glam was marked out for a European town. Land allotments were numbered, registered, and marked on a map. Over 15 miles of quality road had been laid, half of which were wide carriage roads. And these roads included rather prosaically known, named Beach Street, Hill Street, River Street, High Street, and a four mile road leading up Fort Canning Hill. Footpaths see, and horse paths were also laid out. At the request of the boogies, Farker ordered further dredging of the Rosha River, making it more navigable upstream. And this in turn led to an expansion of the boogies' kampong along the river, and outposts were established on St John's Island and Goa Island. Farker passed measures to ensure the health and safety of residents. Because fire could spread very quickly through the wooden buildings, he instructed residents to store as much water as possible to fight such a threat. And to combat the outbreak of disease, especially cholera, <coughs> residents were told to keep their houses and yards clean and swept. He forbade residents to throw rubbish onto the road. So the image of Singapore as a clean city, in fact, began with Raffle, uh, Farker. Better, <laughs> I better get that right. Most importantly, however, Farker strove to establish Singapore as a regional trading center. He wrote to the local Malay sultans, as well as to the monarchs of Siam and Cambodia assuring them of British friendship and of his assistance to their traders while they were at Singapore. And Malay expert Annabel Gallup noted, quote, the exceptional care and delicacy with which Parker nurtured his relations with the neighboring Malay states. And she concluded that his letters were a pivotal factor behind Singapore's early rapid growth in regional trade. Next one. And that is just, well, a copy of one of Farker's letters. Scattered around the world, there is quite a selection of his Jawi letters. We all know about Raffles' Jawi letters, but not so much about Farker's ones. That one's from the Library of Congress. Farker's initial correspondence with the Sultan of Brunei in November 1819 opened up diplomatic relations with that state. Now, as I mentioned, Farker was aware of the importance of Siam and in the hope of encouraging trade, sent a letter and presents to the king with merchant John Morgan. And he envisaged that trade would soon extend Japan. Farker emphasised Singapore's facilities, the extensive safe roadstead and the gateway it opened, trade, opened for trade to the eastern archipelago, plus its free trade status, although Raffles intended that to be a temporary measure only. Realising the significance of local trade, Farker sent import and export figures direct to Hastings as evidence to press for the retention of Singapore. It was already becoming the local base for selling British products, especially peace goods, as well as Indian textiles, which were excluded from British markets. Farker was convinced that if Singapore were kept, it would become, quote, the emporium of Eastern trade, 
even surpassing Batavia. And the results spoke for themselves. In 1822, over 1,500 vessels arrived in Singapore, of which 97% were non-European. That year, imports and exports amounted to over 8.5 million Spanish dollars, and they outstripped Penang's. Opium was by far the most lucrative commodity. Indeed, one boogies merchant had brought some 60,000 Spanish dollars in cash to purchase 40 chests of opium. Turning to Farker's other achievements in Singapore, the most important was his establishment of, of the police force. Initially, he had laid down rules to protect property and maintain peace amongst the various inhabitants. However, his efforts to curtail the Chinese black market gangs and to restrict gambling and the sale of mud up or prepared opium through cooperation with the Capitans and chiefs was proving, were proving ineffective. And as the population increased, so did the crime rate, largely due to gambling and smoking opium. So to deal with these issues, Farker told Raffles of his proposed two-prong approach in November 1819. Firstly, he wanted to establish a police department. And pending Raffles' approval, he employed David Napier as the police, dis police assistant. Raffles relayed Farker's plans to Hastings, but Hastings was not enthusiastic as he thought Singapore would revert to the Dutch. Hence, Raffles refused to sanction Napier's appointment. So Farker's son-in-law, Francis Bernard, then replaced Napier working for nothing for his father-in-law. In August 1820, Raffles authorised Bernard's appointment along with the employment of Asian staff. And we should note that this is a very early police force. In England, one was established only in 1829. Now secondly, Farker wanted to introduce licences, and these were monopolies to manage gaming houses and the sale of Iraq and opium, and the sale of licenses would also give him revenue, which he desperately needed to administer the settlement. Now, while Raffles prevaricated over Farker's plan, he told his friend Captain Thomas Travels that, quote, a certain number of houses may be licensed for the sale of opium. Meanwhile, Farker had gone ahead and introduced trial licenses, which limited the sale of opium and Iraq and limited public gaming. At the same time, he prohibited cockfighting, apart from on specific Malay festivals and only with his prior permission. It was a sport which he absolutely hated and yet the false claims that he authorised it still persist. Now, as I mentioned, Raffles replied in 1820 also to this dispatch, stating he had no objections to, to the Iraq and gaming licence, but urged Farker to ensure that the opium licence would have no adverse effect on the sale of raw opium, right? Raffles wanted to make Singapore the base for transshipping opium within the region. And he then instructed Farker to organize the opium licenses every three months. Now Farker's other contributions to early Singapore including as, included establishing an experimental spice plantation with coffee, cotton, sugar, 
various spices, and recording Singapore's daily temperature and pressure readings. And they will provide an interesting benchmark for comparisons today. Then in August 1819, he rediscovered a new deep water harbour south of the town, which he named New Harbour. And he sent Captain Harris to sail through it and take soundings. In 1909, this was renamed, not Farker Harbour, but Keppel Harbour. Farker was an experienced cartographer as well. In 1820, he produced the first detailed outline, outline chart of Singapore Island. And this was based on his own local surveys and information provided by James Franklin, who was the brother of the Arctic explorer, and Francis Bernard, who he, whom he had sent to navigate the island. And here we see perhaps a touch of vanity as Farker Straits appears on the map. You can just see it down there. It didn't last for very long, though. By the time Crawford had redrawn his map, there were no Farker Straits. He also drew up a large-scale chart of the settlement in 1821, as well as another detailed map showing the town, <coughs> New Harbour, and adjoining islands. In 1825, Farker offered that map to the East India Company. Can we have that one? Oh, that's it, yep. It was accepted and deposited in the library in June 1825, which makes a lot of people think that the map was drawn in 1825, but it wasn't, it was 1822. However, Farker was not acknowledged as the cartographer or the donor of the map. We've only got his dispatches to show it. Farker established a prototype post office, encouraged the work of missionaries, helped them set up and helped them set up Singapore's first school. I think that was 18, 1820. He was involved in the establishment of Raffles Singapore Institution and was designated its first president and a trustee. And Singapore owes its esplanade to Farker. When Raffles started selling off blocks of land, Farker wrote to him, urging that land suitable for future defence purposes be retained. And Farker recommended that a large area be reserved for an esplanade, and that no further land or permanent buildings be permitted within it until further orders from Hastings. See, Raffles went on a land-selling spree, and the land wasn't his. It belonged to the Malays. So, in fact, he was trying to sell off the landlord's property, which was not a very ethical thing to do. Now, as often happens in bureaucracies, not only the work done by a subordinate, but his ideas also can be attributed to, an, to a higher authority. Thus, Raffles is given the credit for Farker's suggestions that merchants be involved in committees and decision-making, that individuals whose lands had been cleared at public expense should pay the cost. He also recommended sitting up, setting up a court of requests and came up with a humane plan for lessening and even ending the practice of debt slavery. And we mustn't forget that it was largely because of Farker's good reputation while governing Malacca that Singapore's population grew so rapidly. Men from Malacca who knew and respected Farker flocked down to Singapore to find work or to trade. Indeed, by 1823, some 5,000 of Singapore's residents had come from Malacca. Those Malaccans brought the muscle and the money to develop the post. 
wealthy merchant Tan Chi Sang, who had enjoyed a very close relationship working with Farquhar and Malacca, brought capital for investment and leadership expertise. Other entrepreneurs, such as Tan Tok Sing, made significant contributions to the development of the early settlement. The Boogies and the Indians also came because of Farka. In particular, Prince Balawa and 500 Boogies. Farka had gone out on a limb offering these men political signum. And despite the protests of the Dutch and without the permission of Raffles and Hastings, he allowed them to stay. And he was later vindicated. But throughout Farker's administration, a cloud hung over Singapore's future. Hastings was certain that the post would be returned to the Dutch. Hence, as early as September 1819, he had ordered severe reductions on costs and personnel and stopped all land clearing and new construction work. These instructions which reached Farker in 1820 put a dampener on his plans, but he worked within them to create a thriving port. And Raffles himself proved a, a big problem. Even after establishing the post at Singapore, he felt that Britain needed a base close to the Sunda, Straits of Sunda. And in fact, he seemed only to take the occasional interest in Singapore's progress. Communications with him were sporadic. Farker waited up to nine months for replies, even to urgent questions. Raffles sometimes failed to respond to questions, despite Farker's repeated requests for answers. And this made it harder for him to govern as all major matters had to be authorised by Raffles. And of course, Raffles' orders were subject to approval from Hastings. So you had this triangular and hierarchical communication between Singapore, Ben Coolin, Calcutta, and vice versa, which caused Farker much angst. In fact, he rightly lamented that life would have been far easier had he been directly answerable to Hastings and Calcutta. And as he later complained, Raffles seemed to retard, obstruct, and render abortive measures which he needed to implement in Singapore. Now, it's not always realized that Farker was Singapore's only commandant and resident. In other words, he was responsible for the military and civil administration. Nor is it fully appreciated that he was building the settlement from scratch. He had limited manpower, few provisions, and little money, as I mentioned, and he even lacked surveying tools. The site was largely covered in jungle, and the island provided few resources beyond water, timber, and fish. Farker was continually frustrated by shortages of provisions, defense material, and money. Raffles had insisted that all supplies were ordered through him at Ben Coolin and not from Penang, which was far closer. And Raffles sometimes sent old stock, damaged stock, the wrong stock, and he billed Farker at horribly inflated prices. However, it was Farker's determination to cater to the merchants that led to his downfall. He knew that the merchants were vital for Singapore's future, and he allowed them to build their go-downs on the north bank of the river. <laughs> 
But Farker, uh, Raffles had set aside that land for government purposes. And Raffles wanted the merchants to, set it, to settle at East Beach in Kampong Glam. But the merchants and Farker considered the site to be impractical. Hence, he provisionally allowed them to build on the North Bank, arguing that had he not done so, quote, Singapore would have completely withered in the bud. His decision was pragmatic, but fatal, as, Farker, as Raffles would use it against him. When Raffles finally returned to Singapore in October 1822, he was a very sick man and intended to return to England within two years. He was again delighted at the settlement's transformation. But Raffles decided to take the glory for this new Singapore, remodel the town as his, and he began to sideline Farker and he engineered his downfall. Raffles illegally dismissed Farker as residence and took over control of Singapore on the 1st of May, 1823. Mm -hmm. Farker left Singapore in December 1823. He had been greatly loved and respected by the local peoples. The Boogies, Chinese and Indian communities showed their gratitude to him and their heartfelt loss at his departure in their poignant farewell addresses. The Chinese community gave him the splendid silver épinée, which is held in the National Museum. And, do the next one. The next, thanks. Um, this beautiful silver cup, costing 3,000 Spanish dollars, was gifted by the 25 European and Armenian merchants in the town. That was nearly the entire number of merchants to show their appreciation of Farker and his achievements. In conclusion, <laughs> right, Farker made vital contributions to the forming and development of the British Post at Singapore. He had suggested it as a site. He had played an influential background role prior to the Treaty of 1819. He persuaded the Malay nobles to withdraw their objections to the treaty, and he refused to evacuate in the face of invasion. He had then organized the clearing of land, erecting of public buildings, fortifications, and infrastructure. He brought in settlers, established a police force, raised revenue, established harmonious relationships with the Malay rulers in Singapore and in neighboring states, and above all, created a thriving port. Without Farka, the temporary post established by Raffles would not have survived. The roles of the two men are complementary. Raffles raised the British flag but Farker kept it flying. Farker was not the founder of Singapore, but he was its developer. By 1822, he, and not Raffles, had transformed the port, the port, had transformed the post into such a successful port that Britain decided it was worth retaining. Thank you, that's it.